Greetings, everyone. Thank you all for your patience as we work through technical issues. And thank you for joining us today as we talk it out virtually on the last day of celebrating Pride Month. My name is Felicia Davis. I am president and CEO of Chicago Council for Women. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I want to start tonight by thanking the LBTQ Giving Council of Chicago Foundation for Women and our partners at Brave Space Alliance for co-hosting tonight's event with us. Thank you so much. As many of you know, we had originally planned to come together in person for this event on March 19th at the Chicago Cultural Center. As CFW is celebrating its 35th anniversary this year, this event was to be the first in a series of free and public events focused on the most pressing issues facing women and girls, transgender and non-binary people across our city. Of course, these plans, just like everything else in our lives right now, change or had to change. And indeed, as we all navigate the complexities of life during this time, sometimes things can seem out of our control and there is certainly some uncertainty. So during this time, I have found strength by focusing on certain fundamental truths. Thing these are the things that I hold close and the things that ground and strengthen me. The first of these is gratitude. I ground myself in gratitude. I place my feet firmly on the ground. I take in a deep breath and I give gratitude and I feel grateful for the air that's in my lungs. I also find purpose in my work and in the work of Chicago Foundation for Women and our grantee community. The fight to achieve gender equity in our lifetimes is more important than ever. COVID-19 and the unthinkable brutality and racism of recent weeks, and not just recent weeks, I was just calling it out in recent weeks, but what has been going on in our country for quite some time, have made crystal clear the pre-existing structural inequities facing our region and our country. For 35 years, Chicago Foundation for Women has been at the front lines alongside our grantee partners, community stakeholders and others fighting against this inequity and these inequities. Um, and that is now top of mind. It's really something that right now um, everyone seems to be talking about and there's a window of opportunity for us to really push through a lot of the changes that we're seeking. EFW, for our part, we work to improve the lives of women, girls, trans, and gender non-binary people by investing in solutions to the most pressing challenges that, face, that women are facing, economic insecurity, violence, and lack of access to health care and health care information. At CFW, we take a unique three-pronged approach to achieve our mission, and that's advocating for underserved women and girls, providing grant support to both emerging and established organizations, and offering an innovative array of leadership development and capacity building programming. Today, 35 years after it began, CFW continues to be one of the only organizations in the region that takes a comprehensive approach to understand and address the issues impacting Chicago area women and girls. And often we are the only organization asking the question, does this have a gender lens? However, as we ask the important question of others, this important question of others, CFW must also turn inward and, and be loving critics of ourselves and our own community. We must ask ourselves, how do we define women, woman, girl? Is our definition an inclusive one? One in which people across the gender spectrum see themselves. Let's all take some time tonight and ask ourselves, am I thinking beyond the binary? This brings me to a third fundamental truth I hold every day. And that's the core belief that if we are to build an intersectional and effective movement for gender equity, it is important that our movements are trans inclusive and gender non-binary inclusive compared to their cisgender counterparts, transgender and gender non-binary individuals experience increased rates of homelessness, housing insecurity, employment discrimination, and lack of access to comprehensive and affirming healthcare services because of their gender identity. 
trans feminine individuals and especially trans women of color face disproportionate violence, including murder motivated by transphobia, racism, and sexism. For many traditional women's rights organizations, including Chicago Foundation for Women, this is relatively new territory at both the organizational and personal level. You are here because you, like CFW, seek to do better, to be affirming and inclusive of people from all gender expressions and identities. This work as a journey, <clears throat> there is no such thing as being woke. I hate that term. Um, instead, we are all, each of us in a constant state of awakening. This awakening will happen for us, but only if we open ourselves to the experiences and push our own comfort zone further than ever before. So today, as we close out Pride Month celebrations, CFW is here to do just that. We are here to learn just like you. Before we dive in, let's do a bit of housekeeping. If you haven't already, please take a moment now to bring up Slido.com on your phone or in another tab of your computer browser. I have it on my phone. And put in the event code for tonight's event, 43662. This is how we are going to interact with one another um, and our speakers uh, this evening. So make sure you log in. It's really super easy. I can do it. Um, or and I did it. <laughs> Once you get it set up, you'll see on your Slido screen the place where you can ask questions. You can submit questions throughout tonight's conversation as they come to you. If you want to submit them anonymously, you can do that also. You can view questions from others and you can vote on those that you want to make sure get answered tonight. Our speakers and panelists will be pausing throughout the program tonight to answer as many questions as they can. Because first and foremost, this is about learning. We will also have an opportunity. Um, uh, we also we also have an opportunity to question you. So we have questions for you that will be launched shortly for you to reflect on and answer as you think of it at any time throughout the program. And last but not least, please be sure to post about our conversation on social media. Be sure to tag PFW, Great Space Alliance, and many of the other partners here, and use the hashtag CFW Beyond the Binary and hashtag talk it out. All right, that's enough of me. Let's get started. I have the pleasure now to introduce uh, Stephanie Scora. Lasaya can't join us tonight. We were expecting both of them, but Stephanie is here and we're eager to hear. Um, their distinguished files are in your digital program book, so I won't go into great detail, but I will share with you that they both are the brains, the talent, the beauty, <laughs> I'm adding that, and the passion behind Brave Space Alliance. Brave Space Alliance is the first black lad, trans lad, LGBTQ center located on the south side of Chicago. I'm on the south side right now. Dedicated to creating and providing affirming, culturally competent, for us, by us resources, programming and services for LGBTQ individuals on the south and west sides of the city. And I must add that CFW is honored and proud to be one of their funders. I'll turn it over to you, Stephanie. Uh, all right, great. Uh, thank you so much, Felicia. Uh, you know, it's it's really, really great to be here. Uh, we love working with CFW and uh, I am really, really gr uh, glad to be able to give this presentation. I was originally uh, gonna have Lasaya alongside me, but we are going to be announcing soon and I think it is the announcement is public now that Brave Space Alliance was awarded the 2020 Pride Award by uh, Kim Fox, the state's attorney for Cook County. And we were told today that the ceremony was at 5.30. So Lasaya had to switch over and accept that award, but you get my wonderful stylings uh, and training ability instead. And I promise I will do a good job to emulate uh, what we are both able to do. So I am going to share uh, my screen quickly with all of y'all and we will get started on this training. So we're going to be doing a very abridged Trans 101 style training so that we can really dig into some of the nitty gritty details about trans identity, trans language, and what it means to be a part of the community. Uh, first, though, I am going to say a little bit about Brave Space Alliance. 
and our staff, usually Lasaya and I do this training together. Uh, on your left, you'll see Lasaya Wade, uh, the executive director and founder of Brave Space Alliance, her wonderful smiling face. And then on your right, you will see me. Uh, I am the associate executive director. Uh, I do everything internally and usually behind closed doors, but they let me out every now and again. Uh, so we're going to give a quick interview uh, or overview of what the training is going to look like tonight. First, we're going to start off by talking about some basic language, breaking that down into identities, basic terms, and frames of reference. And then we'll be talking about sexuality and gender, sexuality as it relates to gender, trans people and sexuality. And normally we do a review, but I am trusting y'all to, to take notes and be smart. Uh, so a quick note about the Q&A. Because we don't have a whole ton of time for this training, and because I do want to make sure to get as much information across to y'all as possible, I am going to ask you to put your questions in Slido. And if you see another question in there, upvote it. I'm going to be pausing for 15 minutes of Q&A at the end of my presentation, and I will start taking questions based on the most upvoted question. So if you've got a question, put it in there. If you think it's a really great question, hopefully other folks will thumbs, we'll give it a thumbs up and I will be able to address it near the top of those 15 minutes. But all right, here we go. Uh, so first we're going to talk about some identity based language in the trans community. I'm going to go through some of the more common terms referring to identities and statuses within the community. Of course, we're going to start off with transgender and trans. There's a lot of text on these slides. That's for accessibility. If I'm talking a little bit too fast or if you lose me for a second, or if for some reason you don't like the sound of my voice and you want to put the computer on mute or something else is going on, you won't really miss anything vital if you read the text on the slides. Uh, so with transgender, transgender is a term that describes a person who does not identify with the gender that they were assigned at birth, but instead identifies with the other binary gender. Now transgender as an identity descriptor generally refers to trans men and trans women. Uh, of course, non-binary people can choose to use this term as well, but traditionally transgender is used to refer to trans people within the gender binary. Now, transgender is a descriptive term, and it is used as an adjective. Because of this, phrases such as transgendered or to learn more about transgender or even uh, or transgenders uh, are grammatically incorrect. Uh, transgender is an adjective because it is describing one's gender. Taking a step back now, we're going to talk about trans, which is the largest umbrella term used to refer to our community. Trans is an umbrella term that can describe people of any gender who do not identify as cisgender and or whose gender does not match the sex that they were assigned at birth. Trans for many, many years was a term that could be used to describe all people who did not identify as cisgender. However, recently the term has been rejected by many people who do not Id identify strictly as trans men or trans women. Many of these individuals say that they are not cisgender, but they're also not trans. This is based on an understanding that trans refers to a specific set of transgender experiences. And those folks believe that since they do not have those specific experiences, trans is not a term for them. And I'm gonna keep coming back to one really important point during the training, and that is with every individual trans person and with every person that you hear uh, using these terms, your mileage may vary. The trans community is huge, complex, and vibrant, and a lot of us mean different things when we say these terms. What I am presenting to you is the most common and commonly accepted definition for what these words mean, but trans people are by no means a monolith. And when we use words to identify ourselves and terms to identify ourselves, just because one person uses the term does not mean another person who uses the same term means the same thing when they say it. Now, I'm gonna talk about another really big group of people within the trans community, and that's non-binary people. Non-binary people, uh, the term non-binary uh, has many definitions and can be both used as an umbrella term or a specific identifier. So generally speaking, someone who identifies, uh, identifies as non-binary does not identify as either a man or a woman, not in the gender binary, can have a gender that is either static, stays the same, or changes, can have a gender that is something specifically non-man, non-woman, or is broadly non-binary, 
a non-binary person can use a variety of pronouns uh, and non-binary the non-binary community has a variety of pronouns that it encompasses it's not all folks who use they them and many non-binary people have a gender that is specific to their culture or ethnicity non-binary people according to recent research are actually the plurality of people in the trans community that means that according to the 2015 national trans uh, U.S. Trans Survey, I was going to say the National Trans Discrimination Survey, but that was the 2008 one. Uh, according to the U.S. Trans Survey, a national survey of trans people done in 2015, the trans community consisted of 33% trans women, 33% trans men, and 34% non-binary people. So non-binary people make up a significant portion of our community. Related to non-binary, but actually quite different, is the term gender non-conforming. And I really, really love talking about this term because it is so broadly misused. Normally, if I was giving this training in person, I would ask a lot of you to raise your hands if you've heard the term TGNC to refer to all trans people. And I, I really don't like that term. And that's because gender nonconforming is not actually a term that originates within the trans community. It's often mistaken as a term with its origins in the community. And it became near ubiquitous in early 2000s academic literature as a way to describe the experiences of trans people who were neither trans men nor trans women. However, the term does not actually describe a trans experience of gender. It describes an experience of gender that's consistent with an intentional rejection of gender roles and expressions, but not assigned gender itself. Someone who is gender nonconforming can be either cisgender or transgender or trans more broadly. And in fact, most gender nonconforming people are not trans. Gender nonconforming is not a one to one stand in with the, for the term non binary. They are not the same, they have different meanings. And another term that I've been using quite a bit is the term cisgender. This is a term used to describe a person whose gender matches the sex that they were assigned at birth according to the norms and systems of power and control in our society. Cisgender people are the default and are just men and women, rather than being cisgender men and cisgender women. Cisgender people have societal privilege over all people who are not cisgender. And the system of power and control that attempts to coerce people into being cisgender or apply that, imply that being cisgender is better is called cis supremacy. It is a commonly held belief that most or the majority of people are cisgender, however, because we live in a cis, uh, however, because we live in a cis supremacist society, it is impossible to know for sure. Because one of the most sinister aspects of cis supremacist society is that individuals are prevented from learning about their gender or identifying with their gender beyond the binary from a very young age, often for most of their lives. So we're gonna move on to some more basic language terms and stop talking about identity specific ones for a second. Some, we're gonna start off with a really basic language term, which is also quite a complicated one, and that's gender. Gender can be most simply defined as a range of characteristics, including mental, behavioral, and psychological characteristics pertaining to and differing between masculinity, femininity, and the general expression of self. Gender can be divided into three distinct areas of interest. Gender, which is often known as gender identity, the person's private sense and experience of their gender. Gender expression, which is the gender that a person is intending to, to appear to others as, and the gender that one is wanting to appear as. And gender presentation, the gender that one appears to others as, and the gender that others perceive one to be. Now those last two, when those don't match up, some really important things happen, and we're gonna get into that a little bit later. Transition is another really common term. You hear a lot about transition, and transitioning is a common but not universal experience among trans people. The transition itself consists of changing the way that one exists in the world and one's own portrayal of oneself to be more congruent with that person's identity. Transition is generally divided into two distinct categories, which are social, and medical transition. However, it is an incredibly important, if you take one thing away from this presentation and you don't take anything else away from it and you didn't know this before, it is incredibly important to remember that while transition might be the dominant narrative about the experiences of trans people, not every trans person transitions. Additionally, among trans people that do transition, 
each person's transition is unique to them, even if there may be common themes that occur repeatedly across many people's transitions. Again, not every trans person transitions, and you do not need to transition in any way in order to be a member of the trans community. So we're going to have our first activity here, I think, and this is when we're going to be talking about pronouns. Pronouns are part of grammar. Everybody uses pronouns, whether or not you know it. Uh, they are reference that most people use when speaking about themselves or anyone else. Everyone knows how to use pronouns. Chances are you have been doing it most of your life. Most languages have pronouns. I think actually all languages have pronouns, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, so I will say most. Uh, and almost everyone has a pronoun. Generally, people who do not wish to be referred to with a pronoun will ask to be referred to by their name instead. So I'm going to ask y'all, what are some pronouns that y'all know? I want you to list them. I think uh, Emily has an activity up in Slido with, um, do we have an activity? Do we have an activity up in Slido? We do have an activity up in Slido. Uh, share any pronouns you have seen or heard used, any of them at all. It doesn't matter if you've heard them once or if you've heard them a thousand times. List them. We're going to create this great list um, that we're going to show later on. In the, uh, in the presentation. Also, somebody is not muted. Uh, and whoever that is, can you please mute yourself? Because I can hear some clattering in the background. Uh, so carrying on a little bit, uh, using someone's, please continue listing if you can. Uh, but using someone's pronouns is not optional. Using someone's pronouns is a basic way of respecting that person as a human being. You do not have to understand someone else's identity to respect it. And you do have to respect other people's identities. So I'm going to give you all another few seconds to list those pronouns, list some pronouns that you've, uh, that you've heard, and then I'm going to move on again. Okay, great. Uh, so the next thing we're going to talk about is the gender binary. So the gender binary is rooted in Christian colonialism and white supremacy, specifically European Christian colonialism. The gender binary is a way of attempting to categorize all people into two gender categories, man and woman, and set those two categories on opposing ends of a binary system. In reality, we know that gender is not binary and never has been. Nearly every indigenous culture in every part of the planet has more than two genders. And the gender binary was actually invented by the Catholic Church as a justification for colonialism alongside white supremacy and a means through which to spread colonial Christianity into indigenous populations and colonized peoples. Out of the gender binary came transphobia. Transphobia is the form of oppression that targets trans people based on our trans status. This often takes the form of stereotypes, forcible gender policing, and state-sanctioned violence. Now, nearly every trans person experiences transphobia to some degree. Some people who are not trans can also experience transphobia because transphobia is not intended to eliminate trans people. It is intended to police and eliminate gender variants. You do not actually need trans people to be present for transphobia to occur in a space. You don't need the concept of trans people to be present in a space for transphobia to occur. All you need is gender variance to occur in that space and you will find some transphobia or people in that space who have experienced transphobia. Gender non-conforming cisgender people can and do experience transphobia to a lesser degree. However, they are not its primary targets. They're simply other, other people who are impacted by transphobia as a system of power and control. An alternate term to transphobia uh, is that Brave Space is actually trying to advance is trans antagonism. And we're trying to switch out this language between transphobia and trans antagonism, because if you look at the word transphobia, if you break it down to its roots, it doesn't actually make a whole lot of sense. A lot of the people who really hate trans folks, who don't like trans people at all, who wish we were dead, aren't scared of us. They know exactly what we are and they aren't afraid of us. They simply hate us. And so it's not accurate to say that they have a phobia of trans people. They're simply antagonistic to our very existence. And so Brave Space Alliance has started using trans antagonism in some of our official literature. And at some point in the future, we may choose to switch over entirely between stopping using the term transphobia and switching entirely to trans antagonism. 
So we're going to talk a, a little bit about some frames of reference for gender and the trans community. So gender as a social construct. Again, if you were in person, I would ask you, raise your hand if you've heard about gender being a social construct. So many people's frame of reference for gender is that gender is a social construct. And of course, this implies that gender itself and its significance are entirely made up or wholly informed by the society that we live in. Unfortunately, the idea of gender as a social construct leaves little room for the decolonization of gender or gendered expectations. Gender as a social construct often speaks to largely a white experience of gender, which imagines gender itself as something external that's done to people, rather than something that can be experienced or not experienced by each person individually in their own way, and that exists in a system of power and control that categorizes those experiences and attempts to create a hierarchy based on which experiences are deemed the most and the least correct. Now, gender as a lived experience is another very important frame of reference. Others describe gender through this framing of being a lived experience where each per person's experience with gender is unique to them and difficult or impossible to duplicate. This frame of reference holds that there are as many genders and gender experiences as there are people alive on our planet right now. The idea that gender as a lived experience allows for cultural interpretations of gender and allows for gender to be something that's mutable based on one's experiences and changes throughout the course of a person's life. Gender, or the lack thereof, is an important part of the human experience, according to this frame of reference, and informs much of how people interact with each other and the ways in which we can experience life. Personally, I prefer the gender as a lived experience frame of reference because it allows for more anti-oppression work to be done through a gendered lens. If we accept that gender is simply a social contract, construct that's something that's done to us by society and, cate and entirely categorized based on society's standards, in order to dismantle oppressive systems that are based on gender, we then have to get rid of gender or dismantle gender itself. And I don't actually think that that's the most useful way to understand something that for many people is a core part of their, exp of their lived experience. If we understand gender more broadly, as a natural part of human experience, whether you experience gender or not, interacting with gender is a natural part of the human experience. Then we can really, really take a look at how gender impacts human civilization, how gender has shaped culture, and how each individual person's gender is informed not just by a rigid set of societal norms, but instead by their unique experiences as an individual who exists in a specific culture, place, space, and time, and their individual experiences with how those factors and many others have shaped their gender. Many genders can be similar, but in fact, most people have a gender that's at least slightly unique to them. So moving on again, we're gonna talk a little bit about sexuality as it relates to gender, sexuality and gender side by side. I know these two are not the same thing. I don't often think that I have to say that. And then whenever I say that, I don't think that I have to say that. I always run into somebody that makes me actually have to go back and say it again. So I'm going to talk about sexuality and gender at the same time. So how does sexuality actually interact with gender? Sexuality and gender develop as largely independent qualities from one another, yet they do interact significantly. Sexuality is determined in relation to the gender or genders that a person experiences attraction towards. One's sexual identity, sometimes known as their sexual orientation, is the term that describes how their sexuality interacts with their gender. For example, a homosexual person is attracted to genders similar to their own, a heterosexual person is attracted to genders different than their own, and a bisexual person is attracted to some, but not necessarily all genders, similar to and different than their own. And of course, a pansexual person can be attracted to someone regardless of their gender and how it interacts with the pansexual person's gender. The, inter the, the interaction between and difference between sexuality and gender is crucial for, for understanding how things like transphobia and homophobia function. So trans people and sexuality. This is everybody's favorite part. It's always everybody's favorite part to ask about trans people and sexuality and talk about trans people and sexuality. There's a, a wide degree of sexual demographics in the trans community. Unfortunately, though, there is not much research available on those demographics. 
folks seem unfortunately more keen on studying the community for our negative experiences rather than the people that actually make it up. The most recent comprehensive data available on transsexuality is, avail is from the 2015 US Trans Survey conducted by the National Center for Trans Equality or NCTE. It found respondents were most likely to identify as queer, pansexual, gay, lesbian, or same gender loving, then straight, bisexual, and asexual. However, it's important to note that when you're quoting the US Trans Survey, the survey's respondents were disproportionately white to, compared to what we know about the community or even the country's demographics as a whole during the time. So when you're quoting it, it provides a lot of really, really important research and data on the trans community. And it's actually one of the most comprehensive data sets out there about trans community experiences, although it is getting a little bit old now. But the survey's respondents were very, very, very white and the data is colored by those experiences. Now I want to talk about heterosexual trans people. People often get really surprised when I start talking about heterosexual trans people, and that's because we've started to think of all trans people as necessarily queer, necessarily gay, necessarily something going on with our sexuality. But in reality, there are a lot of heterosexual trans people, and I mean a ton of heterosexual trans people. Brave Spaces Alliance's evidence, gathered from a mix of anecdotal and survey-based re uh, research, suggests that black and brown trans people are actually more likely to be heterosexual than their white counterparts. However, we don't offer an explanation as to why. It could very well be that the population that we serve is, is a statistical anomaly and is disproportionately heterosexual, and we are more than willing to accept that as, as a fact. But it's important to treat trans people as not a universally queer population because heterosexual trans people have unique needs of their own, as do their partners. Heterosexual trans people do matter, they do exist, they are in your communities, and they are part of the trans community. Just because somebody is heterosexual does not mean that they're not part of the LGBTQ community, because the T is right in there, and there are a lot of heterosexual trans people. Now let's talk about some of the unique needs of trans people in LGBTQ spaces. Unfortunately, trans people are routinely left behind in these spaces. The unique needs of trans people in LGBTQ, uh, or in LGBTQ spaces are an entire presentation in and of itself. But generally speaking, the, way, the best way to address our needs is to put us at the forefront, feature trans speakers, uh, trans authors, artists, and people in general in your programming. We're an important com part of community history, and we love to show ourselves off. Another important way to meet the unique needs of trans people is to admit what you don't know. If the effort to reach out is earnest and sincere, usually there will be a trans person or a group who is more than willing to do education. And of course, be proactive. Trans people can always tell if we're an afterthought in your programming, office culture, event, or whatever else. Trust us, we are very, very used to it, and we can smell tokenization from a mile away. Most of us have experienced it firsthand, and almost every single one of us who regularly appears in public for events or panels or what have you has been a last minute addition to an LGBTQ event, either because the organizers remembered, crap, I forgot to include a trans person, or more commonly, were called out by members of the community for erasing an important part of, of our group. So I'm going to pause really quick and do some Q&A here. Uh, I'm going to get on Slido. I really, really, really encourage you to pick up your, your phones, ask some questions on Slido, and I am going to start with the question at the very top, which is, uh, use this link. Thanks again for your understanding. Great question. Uh, no, so the question at the top is, uh, how do you address TERFs, trans exclusionary radical feminists, uh, along a women's organization's community members? I think that's a really, really great question. I'm really glad I get to start with a question about TERFs because uh, dealing with TERFs is a pet project of mine. Um, I think, you know, the best way to deal with TERFs in a women's organization is to set a zero tolerance policy. A lot of women's organizations have incredibly troubled histories with people who don't think that trans women are women and usually folks that don't think that trans people our people. The best way to deal with those folks is to let them know that that organization will not tolerate trans exclusion in its culture. Let TERFs know that they have zero space and zero platform with your organization and that your organization 
is a group that actively affirms trans people. And then you have to do the work to actively affirm trans people and make sure that you root out TERFs who are in your space. It's important to note that TERFs are not just women who may disagree with you about gender or feminists with a different perspective, maybe from a bit of a bygone era. They are right-wing, anti-trans, deeply concerning members of a broader community that includes hate groups and right-wingers that oppose the rights of pretty much everyone on this call. Recently, TERFs worked with neo-Nazis, anti-abortion activists, and right-wing Republicans in the US to try to strike down trans protections on the federal level, and they were successful. TERFs are widely known for collaborating with members of the alt-right and other fascist organizations. So if you allow TERFs in your space, you're allowing people who are dangerous to every member of your community. It's not a matter of really what or when, it's a matter of how quickly can you get rid of them and how clear can you make yourself that your organization will not be a platform for TERFs and will not allow them to find space there. The best way to deal with people like that. The next question, oh, this is cute. What advice do you have for my absolutely amazing non-binary 10-year-old? Oh, um, my advice is honestly, you know, I think your non-binary 10-year-old is going to do great. Uh, part of how I know that is because they're non-binary and they're 10. Uh, kids are a lot gayer nowadays. I'm not just saying that to be funny. It's actually true. There's some research that suggests that over 50% of Gen Xers identify as queer or trans. Um, you know, luckily, the kids are growing up in a different world than a lot of the rest of us did. It's a lot more okay now to be queer, trans, non-binary, what, what, you know, what have you. And I think the most important thing that I would tell your child is, you know, don't be afraid to keep being yourself no matter what everybody else says. Other kids can be really mean, but it's because they don't have an understanding of themselves that's as comprehensive as, as your child's might be yet. And it's also okay if their identity changes. If they identify as non-binary now and they want to pick a, if they want to pick a different identity later, or if their gender shifts, or if they want to stay non-binary for the rest of their life, that is totally okay. Their gender is valid, and they're they're really still figuring out a lot of things in life. And so, I would say, you know, I'm glad you're part of the community. We're really, really glad to have you. Take care of yourself. Uh, stay in school. And we're really, really glad that you get to live in this world that's more accepting of you than it was of us. Um, ooh, great. Uh, how can I be an impactful accomplice right now? What are some of the things you would like help with day to day or that I should bear witness to? This is also a really important question. So I think, you know, it's, it's very, very, very important to listen to the things that trans women are trying to tell you. I'm going to stop sharing so that it, we can stop staring at a giant Q&A on the screen. Um, it's really, really important to listen to the things that trans women are trying to tell you, especially Black trans women. You know, we have to make sure that we're listening when Black trans women talk about their experiences, when they talk about valuing their lives before they're dead, and when they talk about valuing their deaths as much as any other member of the community, whether that community is the trans community or the black community. Because one of the things that Brave Space Alliance has unfortunately had to say over and over and over again is that during this time of increased Black Lives Matter organizing, it's important to remember that all black lives matter. Queer and trans black people's lives are more at risk than their cisgender and heterosexual counterparts. We have structural oppression and data and evidence to suggest and confirm this. And those folks deserve just as much attention as, as everybody else in the community. And the same goes for the LGBTQ community also. Black trans women and brown trans women built our liberation movement and deserve all of our love, all of our respect, and all of our attention. Um, so the best way to be an accomplice right now is really listen, pay attention, follow the instructions of black and brown trans leaders, and donate to black-led trans orgs like Brave Space Alliance. Uh, so, next question is from uh, Rada. Uh, how do we handle the risk of forcing someone to out themselves, ooh, uh, out themselves and potentially risk safety by asking everyone to share their pronouns in a group? 
Um, that's a good question. You know, the, the mandatory pronoun share is a complicated thing. It's, a, it's an important topic of discussion. I think, you know, one of the best ways to address that is by simply saying, you know, when you're doing introductions for a group, say, share your name and your pronouns if you're comfortable doing so. That means somebody who might, who might identify as trans or be a member of the community, but doesn't necessarily want to share that in the workplace or in an organizing meeting, doesn't feel obligated to share their pronouns. Um, okay, so we have time right now for one more question. Uh, and it is going to be, how do you support individuals of the LGBTQ community without turning them into the spokesperson for the cause or for change? Ooh, ooh, that's a great question. Um, often the answer is compensate us. Compensate us for our labor, compensate us for our time, compensate us for our experiences and our knowledge. I promise you very, very, very few queer and trans people will mind if they're asked to speak at your event, but you offer them some money in exchange. And actually make it a nice amount of money, don't make it like five bucks. Um, Compensate us for our labor, acknowledge our expertise, make sure that what we are asking you to do and what we're telling you needs change and needs to be addressed is actually addressed. Take our concerns seriously. And when we call you to action, take that action. And I think those are really the most important ways to avoid tokenization is if you're really proactive about doing the things that we're asking you to do, we won't need to ask you more than once. There will be other people who can share the load with us if you've listened to us the first time. And as far as the first time goes, people usually don't mind being included if there's a little bit of something in, the, in it for them on the side, because we are a multiply marginalized people and trans people face very, very high rates of unemployment and economic disadvantagement. Uh, so compensate us for our time if you're going to use us uh, as for, for our sage wisdom. Um, okay, so I think that's all the time that I have from my part of the presentation right now. Um, thank you so much for coming out and listening to me uh, talk and train and share this space with y'all. I'm going to kick it over to Anna Deshawn, who is the wonderful moderator of our panel. And Anna will take it from here. Thank you so much, Stephanie. That was fantastic. Um, I don't think I've ever heard your presentation before, even though I've been in spaces with Brave Space. So that was wonderful. I hope everyone uh, got something out of it. There's a lot of information. So it's on you now to take that information, do your own research, you know, take it, don't just leave it here, but take it with you, right? And embody it. So that was fantastic. I am excited uh, this evening to be joining you all. I am humbled that I was asked to moderate this panel tonight. And I'm glad we're finally able to have this conversation. So I'm joined by a few colleagues. I think we are all here on video. All right. And so to start things off, I want everyone on the panel to, sound like everyone to do their own introductions. I think that always feels better uh, and more authentic. And so if we can go around, if you can just say your name, um, your personal pronoun, if you are comfortable doing so, and why you actually said yes to the panel. So I think that all of us can agree we get asked to do these panels or to have these conversations often. And I think it's always a good place to start as to what your why is, right? What centers you around doing this work and, you know, being a change agent and being open to telling your story. So name, personal pronoun, if you're comfortable, and why you said yes to this panel. Uh, Tanya, it's good to see you. I'll start with you. Hey, everyone. So my name is Tanya Cordova. My pronouns are she, hers, hers, and ella in Spanish. Um, why do I say yes to this uh, conversation? Well, uh, I want people to hear my voice, the, and especially the community that I represent. Um, a lot of times our community, especially our documented community, uh, are not being heard. Their voices haven't been heard, and especially uh, because it's also language justice, uh, that um, our Spanish speak people, a lot of times, they're not being brought into a conversation because the language barrier and um, 
sometimes we there's no uh we don't have interpreters uh, so that's what I'm here because I stand up, I stand up for social justice, economic justice, language justice, and justice at all. That's Thank right. you. Thank you, Tanya. Yeah. You want to go next? Sure. Hi. Hi. I'm Scout. I use they them pronouns. Uh, it's an honor to be here, especially with a moderator, panelists, and presenters who I admire. Uh, glad to be sitting in this table with you. Uh, and to thank you to CFW. I think I'm here today because I deeply believe that access to knowledge is access to power and that knowledge is power. And today we are sharing knowledge to me with the goal of actually shifting how power is distributed. And CFW and all of those who are here today, y'all have access to communities, to organizations, and an opportunity to really shift the way in which we negotiate with our power in the name of gender expansiveness and queer inclusivity. Love it. <laughs> and Angelica. Yes. So that it was a little intro on the why we're here. Amazing. <laughs> um, hey, everybody. My name is Angelica Grace. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I am a 21-year-old Filipino trans, Filipina trans woman um, living in Chicago. Um, yeah, um, why am I here? I, I, I really, I was connected through, so I work with the Bafay Theater and they are Chicago's leading LGBTQ plus theater company dedicated to expanding the national dialogue on gender sexuality, end quote. Um, and, um, oh, English, my brain, my brain. Um, oh, yes, okay, <laughs> yes. And um, the instrument associate, Director of the Batface Youth Theater, Amy Sheehan, uh, connected me with Emily Drake from Chicago Foundation for Women. And that, you know, this this wonderful, amazing panel is being, you know, being produced and in the works. And I was like, oh, yes. And I think, you know, um, as, yeah, as a trans woman of color, as a, as, a, and I, as a young trans woman of color, I think it's really important for, you know, my perspective and my narratives to be heard, especially right now. Um, and that's that's the short answer. So I'll just I'll keep keep it there. <laughs> no, I think that's great. Thank y'all so much for that. Um, my name is Anna Deshawn. Like Stephanie said, I'm founder and CEO of E3 Radio, and so we are an online radio station playing queer and independent music in high rotation. Right. My pronouns are anything respectful, and I, I also have Slido open. Right. And so if you all continue to post questions there and uplift them, we'll make sure we get to them. I definitely want to make time for your questions. Right. We can talk amongst ourselves, but definitely want to hit on points that you all want to discuss as well. Okay. All right. So, Tanya, I want to start with you uh, tonight, because when we were having our conversation and prep for this panel, you used some words that, I, that really touched home which, to me, which was pronoun privilege. Right. And you talked a lot about the harm that is caused when people misgender you or misgender others in your presence. Right. So can you talk a little bit about the name change legislation that you've introduced and then just also how harmful misgendering can be to a community um, and to people? Because I don't think people really get it. Um, I think we can go beyond pronouns in this conversation. I think some people are starting right there. So I'll pass it to you. I think, well, the privilege for uh, just pronouns, yeah. uh, our community, and especially our trans community, uh, has been impacted for um, so long that we are being, we are being getting violence uh, spiritually, verbally, uh, mentally, and physically. Um, the harm when somebody's been misgendered, especially in a public place. And I always give examples. Mm -hmm. And I can give three examples. I can be in a public place, in a public uh, space. And because uh, my ID, I haven't been, if a person have been, has been able to change their name or gender, and uh, this, a, a trans person is in the public space and somebody called them out by the legal name or their pronoun of uh, their pronoun the the pronoun that it doesn't align with us that's harm 
Yes, but calling out in front of a lot of people. And um, also, we don't know what the next person who is sitting us to ask, uh, how they're going to react. Mm -hmm. um, and also, uh, something that I've been seeing and like a post and recently a trans woman, uh, a trans -lat Latina woman got murdered here in Chicago. And before she got murdered, she didn't have the respect, even from her family, because a lot of our families are transphobic and not a lot of our families, they're not still educated about using the right pronouns and the preferred name. Uh, and then after we die or we get murdered or killed, they still misgendering us, even in the social media. And as right now with the social media, especially with this uh, uh, epidemic of violence, uh, it's just like the as defense as tragedy is to defend uh, the, the person who, who is attacking us and try to use the panic, uh, pa gay panic as defense. And that's how the social media is. Mm -hmm. that, that's what we see even in uh, every show, every movie, uh, trans people are always getting violent. So the message that even Hollywood is sending is that people have to re people have to react at violent when they interact with a trans person. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really good point because that makes me think about toxic masculinity mm -hmm. and how that plays out in the culture and how, you know, when we talk about misgendering an individual and talking about harm and safety, safety means life or death. Like safety is not a situation where maybe I I feel comfortable calling the police. This is not that situation. In that moment, it literally is life or death. And if you take the time to read the articles or do your own research, black trans women are being killed at extremely high rates, right? Um, even here in the city of Chicago and those murders go unsolved, right? So when, we are, when we're having these conversations together here, I think we all need to understand the, the magnitude of the conversation. Um, and Angelica, I'd like to, turn this over to you, right, with the work that you and Tanya mentioned is like t film, TV, right? And so the work that you're doing at About Face Theater, um, your presence, the messages that you all are sending in your art and in your work, how how is that translating in schools? How is that translating um, to the general public? How do you feel like that's affecting change? Totally. Um, so one of the many things I do at About Face Theater is I am a part of the education and outreach department. And so uh, this is my going on second year of doing outreach. Um, we're kind of ch changing the name now because so initially the outreach department, we five of us with the director, five of actors, we devise an original show based off of our own experiences. Um, just, you know, storytelling, you know, because, you know, queer people have more layers than just coming out, right? Um, so, you know, we talk about love, we talk about family, we talk about mental health, self care. Um, joy, you know, joy, uh, the, and um, and rightfully so. The show it changes every year, so the stories are always being are always um, are always changing. Yeah, um, and so the show is entitled Power and Pride, um, and I think last year the tone that we were found that we found it was, a lot of it was very it was very solemn last year, and I think it was a lot of us the coming with the new title Power and Pride last year's show. Um, yeah, it was very solemn. It was a lot of, I wouldn't say sad, but very much a lot of talking, you know, talking about trauma and, um, yeah, so it was, it was coming from a very, you know, that place first and like trying and fighting that pride in that. And now looking at this year, um, I just saw someone write yay for joy on the comments. Love that. Um, this year it, we're very much just like, yeah, power and pride. We're very much like we're here and yes, we are queer and like we're very much grounded in it. Um, so yeah, that was a little, little back background on the on the outreach. Um, but yeah, so we devised a show and then we tour that to different schools around Chicago and the Chicagoland area. So we go to middle schools, we go to high schools, we go to colleges. Girl, we go to banks, we go to church, we, they've been to churches. You know, we go to corporate, 
you know, I remember we went, we go to a band last year and like most of the audiences we go to, I, we're usually within like high schoolers. So we, I perform, I performed in my time for like, uh, yeah, high schoolers. And then there was one time when we went to a bank and it was like, just the, you know, the, 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 the vibe difference, the, you know, of, the, of those generations. Um, yeah. Uh, where's it going? By the point. Um, yeah. So we go, <laughs> I'm so sorry. We go to, um, yeah, we go to schools and yeah, just sharing our perspectives and our stories and our narratives and yeah. How, really do, you feel like, like, how do you feel like you're received in schools? Totally. Totally. Um, you know, surprisingly, like nowadays in the past few years, it's pretty good. Like, we, you know, a lot and a lot of the schools that, that I've been to, a lot, a lot of them have been on the south and west sides of Chicago. Um, so we've been to Kenwood, we've been to, I'm literally blanking on every school, but a majority of the schools we have gone to in my time have been on the south and west sides. And the kids there are, they are, y'all, they, when you, you know, sometimes we look at kids and I mean, I'm a kid, I'm still a kid, I'm 21, but like, you know, we look at Gen Xers and we look at literally children under like 13 now. And sometimes we can look at them and be like, okay, hold on. <laughs> but honestly, y'all, like the kids are like, like I have, I really do have a lot of faith in this next generation of kids because they're so receptive and they're so, like they, li they live for the show, y'all. And like this, and really with this show this year, again, like I said, there's, there's so much joy and so much fun in the show. And like, I think they like, they really love to see one. I mean, people, you know, people happy. We love to see that, but also queer people just living their truth and really just, you know, being firm in themselves, like in front of them at like at that age. Like if I always think about, if I, you know, when I was twelve, when I was fifteen, when I was seventeen, if I were to be, if I, if I, if a group of five amazing queer people, queer people of color, this this year the cast is all queer people of color. We love that. Um, if I had seen that, I'm like I. You know, I I would have been, I would have found my journey quicker. <laughs> um, but you know, a journey takes its time. But yeah, I'm like, it really, I think it, it really is life changing because in addition to getting and receiving all the joy, we do get a lot of, you know, young queers and, you know, all the queer babies. And, you know, a lot of them, like we invite them after we have a QA and a session during the show. And then afterwards we like, oh, hey, we're going to be sticking around for a little while. So you can come up to us. And like, yeah, people are just like, you know, they, these like 12, like, 14 year olds are coming up to me and they're being like, thank you so much for your sharing your story. Like young, these young trans kids are really something and my heart is so warm, mm. you know? So yeah, I, I hope that that, that answers the question. <laughs> no, it does. I think it speaks to, to the example that we can all follow, which really leads me to Scout, right? And talking about how you at a traditionally women led organization are really helping to transform the systems that these young folks will eventually, you know, <laughs> be ingrained in to ensure that we are creating spaces that are inclusive. I saw some questions that came in from attendees who submitted questions during the registration process. And that, that was actually a few people who asked about this in particular, like how do we create spaces that are that feel safe? You know, how do we create inclusive environments and how do we begin to change these systems? Yeah, thank you. Thanks for that question, those series of questions. And first of all, good question. I think like we should always be asking that, especially with the idea that what becomes safe or what is defined by some as safe is not what's defined by others as safe. And I think we're seeing that right now, especially with so much of the leadership that is calling out policing as an inherently violent system. And so when we're thinking about the notion of approaching safe spaces, I, I wanna ask who is defining them, who's a part of them, who is like setting the tone for them. And that sort of critical thinking around like, what are the assumptions we are making about the very questions we're asking is something that we really strive to incorporate into our sexual health education. So I work at Chicago Women's Health Center as the outreach and education director, and I coordinate programming for fourth through 12th graders and their adult caregivers, adult allies, their, whether they're parents or guardians or caregivers or staff people at youth focused organizations or schools. And we really encourage critical inquiry and analysis of the questions we ask. So an example of thinking about how do we challenge other primarily cis focused organizations or organizations that have been cis led to expand their sense of gender inclusivity and queer inclusivity, gender expansiveness 
and maybe asking them to start with some of the same questions you started with. Why do you care about doing this? Who is it for? Who are you trying to center and or decenter when you're creating a quote quote safer space? because our motivations are really going to impact the practices that we put into play. So I don't, I hope that answered your question. But for me, it's about clinically to ask ourselves in what way are we finding up with each other's liberties and in what ways are we actually going to do this for a different reason? Cause that's going to influence the way that I as a non-binary trans person experience your quote, quote, safe space. If I can tell if it is performative, I will be able to feel it. If it is performative, I will feel it. I will not be there. And we've also seen that from queer and trans clients of ours at the Chicago Women's Health Center is that if we have queer and trans people in communities who are experiencing a lack of welcomeness or experiencing hatred and oppression and exclusivity, they will not go back to that health center. They were going to spread the word to their community members and it will be clear. So intentions and motivation you cut out a little bit there, but I think intention. Intentions and motivations, they're very much felt. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's good. I've also heard people use the word sacred spaces and brave spaces as well, outside of just this idea of safe space. Um, speaking to your point that these all have different definitions and really have to be defined by the community, right? Um, which leads me to relationships. Um, so Angelica, I'll go back to you with this one. Um, when we talk about being in relationship with folks, I think that that is really at the heart of how we begin to change people's hearts and minds around what it means to be inclusive and what it means to, um, welcome gender, um, gender not conforming, uh, non-binary transgender folks into the community. When you all are developing these scripts, for about face theater and ready to tell your story. So what is the process that you all take to ensure that when you all are up there on stage and um, telling your stories that people feel what you're saying and so that you can begin to build that relationship and break down some of those walls? Mm, totally, that's a great question. Um, you know, uh, in the process of building the show and devising the script, it honestly, it really, it really feels like therapy because we literally sit down for like three to four weeks, you know, at least three to four times a week. And we just write, we just uh, respond to a bunch of props from our director, Lexi Saunders, who's amazing. Um, and yeah, like it's questions that are like, write a letter to your mother or like, you know, what is, you know, going back to joy, like what does queer joy look like to you? Or if, you know, th yeah, things like things of that nature. And yeah, it very much feels like therapy and it very much sometimes, yeah, it, it really hits in the process and it really, and it gets really deep. And then in terms of when we're actually in the schools and establishing that space for us as the artists and us as a family on stage and like being safety, being safe with ourselves, um, you know, there have been, I think we'll, you know, it's all, I mean, it's a live show. So like, we're always, you know, in check with, in, in, in tune with each other and like making sure we're all okay. And you know, there are sometimes, when we think about sustainability with the shows and we think about the pieces, like, can you do this piece about your mother, about your birth giver for a whole year? Can you, you know, can you, can you do that? At, like maybe like once a month um, and keep it sustainable and like, and be okay with that. Um, and so like, you know, always checking in with each other about that and being like, oh, like, hey y'all, like today or this, this show today, I, I don't want to do this piece because I'm not in this place to do that. And we allow that, of course. Cause we know, we know, I mean, hello, you know, we know that it's hard. And then also in terms of kind of, uh, in that safety and res uh, responding from the audience there, there have, there have been a few times when like, you know, we do get really vulnerable on stage and there have been audiences, kids that are not paying attention at all. And so we've had like, you know, we've had a couple of disrespectful kids, but usually not. Um, but yeah, it's like, there's one, there was one time where we, we, we just stopped doing the show and like, we, we all got really frustrated on stage and we, we, like, we, we called, called in, called out to the, to the children and we're like, Hey y'all, like we're really, we're up here doing this really vulnerable story, storytelling and we really don't feel respected. And so if this is going to continue, like, we're not, we're going to, we're going to walk away. And like, we had had four performances for that one show slated and we told the the uh, the faculty like hey if y'all don't get your kids in check we're gonna dip or we're gonna leave 
Um, and that was after show number two. So we still had two more with on top of all the heavy stuff we're talking about and on top of the kids. So yeah, Jess, <laughs> I think, yeah, going back to your point of like, yeah, building that, building that safety together and like always being in tune and in check with each other and like, um, yeah. So I love, no, that's good. I appreciate that. And Tanya, I think this is a good one. I'm, I'm checking Slido because I want to be, I want to honor the questions here too. Um, and this is one question I had in my mind too. I think it's important for us to talk about COVID uh, today. Um, and you know, this question says, what are some of the unique challenges trans and non-binary folks are facing as a result of COVID-19 pandemic? I'd, I'd love to hear your response to that. Um, I think that one of the biggest barriers that trans people of color or trans people are facing of COVID-19 is housing and stability. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, um, trans people of color are the rate of being homeless is so high right now and the acts the lack of access to shelters for trans people is limited um and especially for undocumented people uh, because our un undocumented we would not eligible for some services. Um, so I, I think housing and the you know is 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 the housing, healthcare as well, um, and especially in my community, even uh, sometimes are they don't not even want to go to the doctor, they don't want to go to the clinic because they uh, assume people saw. Sometimes that people assume that by going to a clinic or any public that um, they're going to ask for your personal information and it's going to be entered into the system. Uh, we all assume that it's going to be uh, sunk, uh, that it's going to lead us to be the, uh, into deportation mm -hmm. because there has been occasions that are the database has been uh, shared with, uh, especially with immigration. Yeah. So uh, I, uh, I have one case that uh, she was sick and she had COVID-19 and she didn't have access. No, she tried to have access to um, uh, Medicare or to, medical, for, to get medical assistance, but, uh, and that time, there was no t testing available. So my client have to go back to her house and deal with COVID-19 by herself. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think lack the lack of um, essential uh, resources that we need, especially food and, uh, and shelter, are uh, are very limited especially for our trans people of color yeah are there any resources that you would share with folks on organizations or places where you know? yeah definitely race Peace alliance is doing a great work uh say el cambio uh which means be the, be the change um i've been doing a lot of work trying to get funding and cash relief for a lot of our our sisters, our siblings, uh, is, is not enough, but something is better than nothing. Uh, Transforming the Justice Law Project as well, we are working to allocate some of the funding for trans people who's been impacted by COVID-19. Um, and there's many other organizations that uh, I think we actually have a list for uh, Trans accountability that there are some organizations and um, this booklet, so people 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 can have access to uh, those organizations to find uh, resources. Thank you, Tanya, and I and I appreciate you mentioning all of your identities as well, 
because I don't think we often think about how we all live at these intersections. And at times like pandemics, when you are living at these intersections, you're impacted on multiple different levels. Mm -hmm. right? And so I appreciate you calling that out because I don't think that that comes to the front of your mind if you, if you live privileged. It's just not something you have to think about or have to be aware of. So thank you for doing that. And, and Scout, from the Women's Center uh, perspective, I can only imagine, what does it look like for you for you all around COVID-19? Yeah, thank you for asking. And yes, agreed, thanks all for sharing. I think another really huge point is that also history of hatred in healthcare settings for trans people and for gender expansive and non-binary people proactively, like preemptively keeps us from wanting to go to the healthcare provider. So I definitely fear going into a healthcare provider under normal circumstances and the increased fear of going in at a time when there are other barriers like transportation is not accessible, like potentially I don't have enough of an internet access to access uh, telehealth. Potentially I'm just concerned as well as about being in another context with more clients who might potentially also be sick that heightened like sense of barriers is all on top of a history of transphobic healthcare. And so for us, I think at the health center, while we've continued to see clients have offered telehealth for both counseling and primary care and preventative care, um, it's also been an awareness that uh, the restrictions, the restrictions for providing telehealth specifically for people who are based in Illinois and the coverage or limitations based on insurance having to be within Illinois, we have trans clients who come to us from all over the Midwest. So people who access the health centers, trans inclusive, queer affirming healthcare from outside Chicago, outside uh, the state and have to travel many hours to come to get us. And the fact that there are those barriers put right now, because in addition, we're seeing those barriers uh, limit people's access specifically and in a more pointed way for trans people in particular. So in short, we definitely have continued providing care and have continued to center the notion that people come into clinic, whether it is in person or online with trauma lived in and on their bodies. And that includes specifically those intersections of identities that y'all have already mentioned. You know, it's really, it's powerful that spaces like this exist because we know that there's lots of places where it does not and where places where you go to get help, you actually get harmed. And so um, and I'm really glad we're sharing all these resources. We've got time for one more question before I pass it back um, to Felicia. So I want to take one more from Slido and I appreciate everybody putting in their questions and uplifting them here. Um, this one says, I have a hard time sometimes elevating my trans identity in a professional workplace. I've been in many institutions as the only trans person. Tell me, I mean, I'm opening this one up to you all. Who wants to take this one? Can you repeat that one more time, love? Yeah, absolutely. I've had a hard time sometimes elevating my trans identity in a professional workplace. I've been in many institutions as the only trans person. No, I, I actually take the one because I'm, I'm very related to the question. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, um, I had been in the situation and the space that I'm being, I had been the only trans woman working for the company. And um, it is hard to elevate your uh, gender identity and to be respected more than anything. I think that uh, everything is about respect. And um, how can, I mean, do we have to disclose our gender identity? That's the question. Do we have to respect? Do we have to disclose? And what benefits will I get to, for, to disclose my gender identity? And wh how harm, what harm would cause if I disclose my gender identity. And I think what I have seen and, 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 and many other cases for uh, trans people who work in, in a company or an organization, they, um, they cannot even disclose that gender identity and 
um, and they cannot elevate their gender identity. And um, it's okay. I think it's more about education as well, that um, if we decide to disclose, is just to educate our coworkers mm -hmm. that we are people, we are sisters, we are, we are siblings, we are aunts, we can be fathers, we can be mothers, and we're part of the community, and we're part of this system, we're part of this country. And that's how I think I, you know, uh, I, I have elevated my gender identity, but uh, I also have been in the situation where I have um, I have to live. I have actually um, not been fired, but um, been um, removed from my position because I have disclosed my gender identity. Yeah. yeah. And it's, I think we could go on for probably another hour around topics and questions here um, from everybody. So first I wanna say thank you to Scout. Uh, thank you, Tanya. Um, thank you, Angelica, for your comments and sharing your perspectives. Hopefully everyone got something and can take it away. I think, you know, overall, if you signed up for this experience, um, you got a training from Brave Space, you heard personal stories, right, of how people are implementing this every day into their work and how they are living, right, in their truth. I think if you are a friend of this community, your job now is to take this information and take it back. Right. Um, the same way black folks shouldn't have to educate folks around racism, right? Uh, trans and uh, gender non binary folks shouldn't have to educate folks about their identity. It's on us to do the work, and I'm glad that you all signed up to do just that. So thank you, CFW. Uh, Felicia, I'll pass it back to you. Anna, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Let me. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Scout, Tanya, Angelica. Thank you all for the thought-provoking, incredible conversation and for helping to educate us. Um, this is part of our effort to expand um, equity everywhere in workplaces. As a funder, we have a role um, that we can shape policy and we work on that every single day. So thank you to the audience for um, today for engaging with us and submitting your questions and ideas. Also, I just can't say this enough. Thank you to Lasaya and Stephanie from Brave Space Alliance for leading us all towards greater understanding and increasing our knowledge. We've done that training for ourselves at the foundation and we look forward to supporting that training for others because information and awareness are really important. I look to the future with wonder and I hope as I think about all of the possibilities for impact, the possibilities for community cohesion and growth that exists beyond the binary. CFW stands committed to do better, um, to do more, to support trans women and gender non-binary people throughout Chicago. We believe in the most expansive, inclusive tent, and that trying to get all of uh, all of the peoples, including uh, the intersection of race and gender, who've been on the borderlands, get those people centered in policy and practice, not just with words um, and events like this one, but we also do that work with our finances and our resources as well. Um, while Chicago Foundation for Women supports all women, girls, and female identified persons across Chicago, today I'm proud to share that just uh, this past week, we invested nearly $1 million in grants with the focus on organizations addressing violence against Black and trans women from across the city, a group that we know is far too often overlooked, and many of the stories that were lifted up today highlight that. And so some of our uh, grantee um, partners there, Brave Space Alliance, to help with that work, Kenwood Oakland Community Organization, um, some work with the reader around messaging and storytelling so that we can lift up these stories and these experiences. Um, and the current pandemic, you know, COVID-19 really demands more from all of us, particularly from philanthropy. This is our role to be counter cyclical, to invest more and to dig deeper. And we hold those responsibilities and I hold those responsibilities as president and CEO at CFW really close to my heart. And while there's no shortage of good work happening now to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic in Chicago, we know from our own experience, as well as our global partners working on international disaster reliefs, 
that typically relief efforts often often neglect the needs of women and girls. I've seen reporting about who's who are the decision makers, um, and as I said earlier, we're often one of the few people at the table who will ask what's the gender lens to this and should we be addressing it in a more specific way uh, and particularly for the needs of women girls and, and gender non-conforming people and other um, communities that have been marginalized we also know that when gender justice groups lead recovery these mo these moments can offer an opportunity to build new and more and a more equal world and that is why uh, CFW has launched the Response, Recovery, and Resilience Fund to help Chicago area nonprofits providing vital resources to women, girls, and trans and gender non-binary people who have been the hardest, hardest hit by COVID and to address um, short-term and long-term needs. Thank you so much to those of you out there who have already made a gift and support of tonight's event. If you have not already done so, I ask that you consider making a gift now in the YouTube chat and in the event description for uh, the YouTube live page, you will see the link to donate to the Response Recovery and Resilience Fund. Please continue to do what you can to take care of yourself and others at times like this. We are called to be um, um, responsible for others. Um, I am because we are, so there is a collective belief there. Um, and with that, I will say, uh, I hope you take good care, um, stay safe um, and well, and good night. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to the team at CFW for pulling it all together. Good night.